physically and spiritually? And you remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment. Now, was all that pious mayhem, the burning of embassies, the killing of nuns, was all of that some kind of great flowering of, of spiritual and ethical intelligence? Or was it egregious medieval stupidity? Well, come to think of it, it was egregious medieval stupidity. <laughs> The truth is that almost any precept we would put in place of the second commandment would improve the wisdom of the Bible. How about don't mistreat children? How about don't pretend to know things you do not know? Or what about just try not to deep fry all of your food? <laughs> could, could we live with the resulting proliferation of graven images. I think we would manage somehow. <laughs> so I submit to you that there is not a person on this earth who has good reason to believe that the Bible and the Quran are the product of omniscient intelligence. And yet billions of people claim to know that they're the word of God. In fact, 78% of the American population claims to know that the Bible is the word of God. 70% of college graduates believe that the Bible is the word of God. So let's leave aside questions of, of religion's truth for a moment. The second way of arguing in defense of God is to argue that religion is useful, and so useful that it may, in fact, be necessary. Now, this, this line of argument is also problematic for a few reasons. The first is that it really is a total non sequitur. I mean, this is not, even, even if religious belief was exquisitely useful, I don't doubt there are circumstances in which it is, in fact, useful. But even if it were useful across the board, this would not give us reason to believe that a personal God exists or that any one of our books are his word. I mean, the fact that certain ideas are useful or motivating, or, or give people meaning in their lives. I mean, the fact that, that the idea that, that uh, God has a plan for me, or every, everything happens for a reason, the fact that such ideas are consoling, does not offer the slightest reason to believe that they are true. And in fact, ironically, they, even if we had good scientific reasons to believe that these ideas were true, their power to console us wouldn't even offer an additional reason to believe that they're true. I mean, even if, the, even if the cosmologists and the physicists came forward suddenly and said, you know, sorry for the misunderstanding, guys, but it seems there is a God and he, he has a plan for you. The fact that so many of us would, would, would find this consoling would give us further reason to be skeptical in scientific terms. This is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and self-delusion and self-deception. This is why scientists do double-blind controlled studies wherever possible. This is why they submit their data for peer review. If we have conquered any ground in, in, in our career of rationality, it is on this point. There is a profound difference between having, between having good reasons for believing something and simply wanting to believe it. Now, of course, there are other reasons to doubt the usefulness of religion. And many of these are enunciated on a daily basis by bomb blasts. I mean, how, how useful is it that millions of Muslims believe in the metaphysics of martyrdom? How useful is it that, that the Sunni and the Shia in Iraq have such heartfelt religious differences? How useful is it that so many Jewish settlers think that the creator of the universe promised them a patch of desert on the Mediterranean? How useful has, has Christianity's anxiety about sex been these last 70 generations? Now, th those who conflate usefulness and truth in defense of religion generally argue that, that religion provides the most reliable foundation for morality. Now, again, before we even, we're even tempted to evaluate this claim, please notice that it is a non sequitur. It is not, even if, even if religion made people moral, this would not provide evidence for the existence of God 
or that Jesus is his son, or any specific doctrinal proposition to which people are attached. Every religion could function like a placebo. They could, they could be extremely useful and entirely barren of content. But let's talk for a moment about the supposed link between morality and, and religion. It seems to me that religion gives people bad reasons to be good, where good reasons are actually available. I mean, ask yourself, which is more moral? Helping the poor, feeding the hungry, defending the weak, out of a mere concern for their well-being, or doing so because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it? The truth is, people do not need to be threatened with damnation to love their children to love their friends, to want to collaborate with strangers, or indeed to recognize that helping strangers can be one of their gr the greatest sources of happiness. And what kind of morality is it that is entirely predicated on a self-interested desire to escape damnation? This seems to bypass the very core of what we mean by morality, which is an actual concern for the welfare of other human beings. Clearly, it is possible to teach our children to form such a concern and to grow in empathy and compassion without lying to ourselves or to them about the nature of the universe, without pretending to know things we do not know. You can teach your children the golden rule as an utterly wise ethical precept without pretending to know that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's also worth observing that the most atheistic societies on the planet, like Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, are in many respects the most moral. They, they have rates of violent crime that, that are far lower than our own in the US. Uh, and they're more generous, both within their own population and in the developing world on a per capita basis. The Sweden, which opposed the war in Iraq, has nevertheless admitted more Iraqi refugees uh, into its borders than any country, and many more than the US has. So if you're looking for a, a state model of Christian charity, the most atheistic societies at this moment fit it better than the most Christian societies do. But what about this notion that we get our morality out of Scripture? Well, clearly we don't get our most basic moral impulses out of Scripture because these can be seen emerging very early. I mean, toddlers 18 months old will, will spontaneously try to comfort somebody who looks upset. And a person clearly doesn't learn that cruelty is wrong by re reading the Bible or the Quran, because if you don't already know that going in, you're just going to be confronted with, with endless celebrations of cruelty in these texts. And these, these books are, are bursting with celebrations of cruelty, both human and divine. The, the God of the Bible hates sodomy and will kill you for it, but he rather enjoys the occasional human sacrifice. I think at the very least we can, we can say he doesn't quite have his priorities straight. In the Old Testament, we witness the most immoral behavior imaginable. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, sexual slavery, the murder of children, kidnapping, all of it not only permitted by God, but mandated by God. I mean, if you doubt this, Take another look at books like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and 2 Samuel and Numbers and 1 and 2 Kings and Zechariah. I mean, these books, on these bo in these books, the, the most unethical behavior is celebrated. If, 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 if these events occurred in our own time, half the prophets and kings of Israel would be shackled and brought to the Hague for crimes against humanity including Moses for slaughtering the Midianites, including Joshua for slaughtering the Amalekites, including Elijah for slaughtering the, pro the prophets of Baal. I mean, these men, by, by our standards today, they were utter psychopaths, as was Abraham for, as Christopher Hitchens recently put it, for taking such a long and gloomy walk with his son Isaac. <laughs> Now, you might wonder, well, what about the Ten Commandments? What about thou shalt not murder? Well, the problem is the Ten Commandments simply give us more bad reasons to kill people. 
I mean, what are you supposed to do when your best friend breaks the Sabbath or erects a graven image or takes the Lord's name in vain? You're supposed to kill him. And if you're unwilling to kill him, your neighbors are supposed to kill you. Is this really the best book we have on morality? Is it even a good book? Now, happily, most Christians and Jews now disregard the morality on offer in the Old Testament. And they rationalize the barbarity we find there by saying, oh, this was appropriate to the time. It was appropriate to the ancient world. The idea being that the Canaanites were so ill-behaved that just getting together a short list of reasons to kill your neighbor and sticking to it was a great improvement over the, the general barbarity of the time. No, it wasn't. It was, it was within the moral compass of human beings then to recognize that killing somebody for adultery was evil. The Buddha managed it. Mahavira, the Jain patriarch, managed it. Numerous Greek philosophers managed it. So, so Jews and Christians are simply lying to themselves when they talk about the impediments to morality that prevailed in the 5th century BC. And, and the other thing to notice is that rationalizing the barbarism we find in the Old Testament merely renders it irrelevant. It doesn't render these books morally wise. I mean, it is faint praise indeed if the best that can be said of much of Scripture is that it can now be safely ignored. Now, and despite what, what Christians say on the subject, the New Testament isn't so good as to make the Bible a reliable basis of morality. In fact, much of the book is an embarrassment to anyone who would say it is a moral book, much less a perfectly moral book. And nowhere is this clearer than on the question of slavery. And the truth is, the Bible in its totality, Old Testament, New Testament, supports slavery. If we recognize anything, if we, if, if we converge on any point in ethical terms now, it's that slavery is evil. Nowhere in the Bible is this evil recognized, much less repudiated. The slaveholders of the South were on the winning side of a theological argument. They knew it. They never stopped talking about it. The best God does in, in the Old Testament is to admonish us not to beat our slaves so badly that we injure their eyes or their teeth, or, or not to beat them so badly with a rod that they die on the spot. If they die after a day or two, no problem. I think it should go without saying that this is not the kind of moral insight that got rid of slavery in the United States. Or consider the treatment of women. I mean, for millennia, the great theologians and, and prophets of our religions have set to work on the, the riddle of womanhood. And the result in various times and places has been widow burning and honor killing and genital mutilation, a cultic obsession with virginity, uh, just other forms of, of physical and psychological abuse so kaleidoscopic in variety as to scarcely admit of being summarized. Now, I, I have no doubt that much of this sexist evil predates religion and can be ascribed to our biology, but there's no question that religion promulgates and renders sacrosanct attitudes toward women that would be unseemly in a brachiating ape. Now, while man was made in the image of God, woman was made in the image of man, according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Her, her humanity, therefore, is derivative. It's erzatz. The Old Testament values the life of a woman at one-half to two-thirds that of a man. The Quran says that the testimony of two women is required to offset the testimony of one man. And every woman is, is deserving of one half her brother's share of inheritance. But the biblical God has made it perfectly clear that women are expected to live in, in absolute subjugation to their fathers until the moment they are pressed into connubial service to their husbands. And the New Testament offers no relief. I mean, St. Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in all things. 